Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing that I can recognize that I know very well everyone in the audience, but I do, and it's nice to see so many uh, of you here. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction, Beth. Um, thank you also to Marlena and Lane for uh, all you have done to help me with the lecture. Uh, I'd also like to thank my father, Dr. Anthony Papalis, for his suggestions. He is a historian. I am not. So much of the material I present today is not uh, original or derived from any scholarly effort. While there has been much written about military medicine, my goal today is to focus on the story of the U.S. military prophylaxis station, a very particular unit or element in military medicine. I will attempt to frame it in a somewhat broader historical context and to highlight the importance of some of the propaganda that was associated with it. So I've given presentations uh, in years past on topics related to the history of syphilis in the 19th century. Um, while I have reviewed the theories of the origin of the disease in those lectures, today I'm going to start at the beginning of the 20th century with several major discoveries in the field uh, of syphilis-related medicine, all happening within five years. So between uh, 1905 and 1910, Three major advances were made, which would enable physicians and researchers to know what in fact was causing the disease and how to monitor for its presence in an infected patient. And just as importantly, what drugs could be administered to eradicate it. In 1905, Fritz Richard Schonden, a German zoologist, and Eric Hoffman, a German dermatologist, described the spiral-shaped bacteria Treponema pallidum. For the first time in history, researchers could visualize the spiral-shaped causative agent of the disease and focus their efforts on identifying its presence in patients. This point, identifying its presence in patients, brings us to the second major advancement, which would be the development of the Wasserman test. The Wasserman test aims to identify certain antibodies in patients infected with syphilis. So instead of identifying the actual spirochete organism, which can be very difficult to do based on the stage of the disease, uh, physicians could identify the patient's immunologic response to the spirochete, thereby allowing them to monitor the course of the disease indirectly. A positive Wasserman test suggests that your body is still attempting to fight off an active infection. A negative test, and you don't have the disease, and you were cured, it's party time. Uh, the stakes were very high for test results though, uh, in the civilian sector, for instance, many states required couples to undergo Wasserman testing prior to marriage. This letter from 1936 informs the prospective groom, Mr. Edwards, that he has passed his test and is all clear to walk down the aisle. A copy of his negative Wasserman is included for his records. While the test was by no means perfect, a modern scientific method was now available to not only diagnose the disease, but just as importantly, to monitor the progress of treatment. And treatment is the last great achievement in this five-year window previously mentioned. In 1910, the future Nobel laureate, Paul Ehrlich, and his collaborators discovered a drug which could cure syphilis. The drug, arsphenamine, a uh, trade name Salversan, was a highly toxic arsenic-based compound which ushered medicine into the modern era with the idea that if we know what disease is caused, then we can have a specific drug designed to cure it. This seems kind of you know, obvious now, but um, this was not the prevailing scientific sentiment or medical sentiment uh, at the time. Thus, the concept of a magic bullet cure for a dreaded disease emerged and fascinated physicians and lay people alike. So we have the discovery of the bacteria, discovery of the test to monitor its presence, and discovery of a cure, all happening in this five-year window before World War I. So moving into World War I, a soldier uh, with syphilis is a casualty. Military physicians had to account for a, a wide range of infectious diseases, which could impact the effectiveness of the army. Malaria, cholera, gangrene, and a wide range of parasitic infections, to name a few, were serious problems for troops stationed overseas. 
Venereal disease was also square on the physician's radar. Soldiers contracting syphilis posed a special problem and were viewed by some as potential enemies within the ranks or even as saboteurs, as uh, this Air Force poster suggests. Prior to penicillin, the drug of choice, as I just mentioned, was an arsenic-based compound. The problem was that depending on the type of arsenic formulation used, the average number of days to achieve a cure could be 100. Furthermore, for administrative purposes, the definition of cured required at least one year of no symptoms and no positive blossoms. With these timeframes, the strain on an individual unit with a high rate of infection was tremendous. So, a strategic emphasis was placed on prevention. Could the military really scare a soldier into abstinence? General Order Number 6 was issued and stated that contraction of venereal disease was an offense punishable by court martial. The maximum penalty would be confinement with hard labor for one month and forfeiture of pay during this period and for the period undergoing treatment. This could last for over a year. Trials by court martial for contracting venereal disease were also allowed under the provision of the 96th Article of War, which allowed punishment for willful misconduct, which rendered a soldier unfit to perform his military duty. This was basically the fun version of shooting yourself in the foot in order to be removed from the front. But your uh, uh, military brass wasn't uh, buying it. Uh, the reality was that soldiers were still having sex and measures beyond advocating for abstinence were needed to prevent infections. So during World War I, the military developed a technique for post-exposure chemical prophylaxis that proved to be, or at least at the time was thought to be, highly effective. Because these techniques were new, the government trained medical officers on how to open and run post-exposure chemical prophylaxis clinics on military bases or in occupied territories. The venereal prophylactic or prophylaxis station, also known as a pro station, soon became a fixture that all soldiers uh, recognized and ultimately dreaded. The military orders I just noted forbidding the contraction of venereal disease emphasized that after sexual contact, the soldier had just two hours to get to the pro, to get to the pro station to receive his treatment. Got to run, got to get there fast. But just how unpleasant did something have to be uh, to warrant these threatening actions? This post-exposure or chemical prophylaxis consisted of the following steps. First step is the easiest. Within one to two hours of exposure, the uh, genitals, lower abdomen, and groin are to be washed thoroughly with a liquid green soap for five minutes. Basically, take a shower. Next, the second step, one dram of 2% silver nitrate solution is injected into the urethra. This was a painful and highly irritating step. The soldier would pinch the opening of the penis for five minutes, allowing from time to time some of the solution to escape. These are the instructions uh, from the textbooks. Uh, after five minutes, a mercury-based ointment is to be thoroughly applied on all parts of the genitals and rubbed in for another five minutes. The area is then wrapped in toilet paper and wax paper to protect clothes, and the patient is instructed not to urinate for four to five hours. Uh, Dr. Joseph Earl Moore, an American pioneer and expert in venereal disease who served in France in the medical corps of the American Expeditionary Force, noted his experience there in VD control, and he says it demonstrated one tragic fact, and I'm going to quote extensively from uh, his textbook here. Although chemical prophylaxis is effective, it is utilizable only under conditions of military or semi-military control. Men will not avail themselves of this procedure unless forced to do so by fear of punishment. Even in the army, when the acquisition of a venereal disease after exposure without prophylaxis formally meant court-martial and additional penalties, many soldiers preferred to run the risk of infection. He goes on to say, to the army physician, to the physician with army experience, the contrast between conditions of military and civilian life are discouraging in the extreme. During World War I, I had under my charge some 75 pro stations, giving more than 100,000 treatments a year. In the ensuing 23 years of civilian life, in private practice and in one of the largest syphilis clinics in the country, I have seen two applicants for prophylaxis, both of these privately and none in the clinic. 
So major strategic shifts were obviously needed to help soften the image of the pro station. And for this, the military would develop and use pro station propaganda. So now fast forward to World War II. On October 11, 1939, AR-40-235 was issued, which directed commanding officers to establish pro stations uh, within each command if needed in the and if needed in the surrounding civilian sectors. Administrative responsibility was also eventually shifted to the Surgeon General, marking an important advance in pro station effectiveness. Pro stations were to be clearly marked <clears throat> with a sign, and the facilities were to be clean, spacious, and properly provisioned. Pro stations were also to be indicated by a green light on the outside in contrast to the red light associated with houses of prostitution. Illustrating this concept is this 1943 U.S. government printing office poster entitled Syphilis and Gonorrhea, the Axis Partners, which uses a four panel comic strip style cartoon to encourage the use of the pro station. At the top, cartoon personifications of syphilis and gonorrhea hatch a plan to do a job on an unsuspecting GI. In the first panel, we see a soldier leaving a brothel or a red light hotel. In the second panel, he is attacked by syphilis and gonorrhea, with gonorrhea even suggesting that they team up to give him a double dose or a co-infection. Poor guy. By the third panel, the soldier is able to jump into a doorway with a green light. Uh, and we see in the final panel that this is, in fact, a pro station and he has escaped uh, the infection and their evil plot. The green light became synonymous with pro stations as this leaflet, which was handed out to sailors stationed in Florida also demonstrates. That almost looks like a green light to me. Is it blue the, in front of the restrooms? Is that blue? Okay, when I first saw I'm a little colorblind, it kind of looked a little green. I got excited. I thought with the great presentation, you even had a, a green light pro, pro station set up, but it's not. Um, so uh, don't be scared to, to walk through those doors. Um, uh, as American and British troops moved from North Africa and into Italy, pro stations were set up inside of or adjacent to brothels, where already well um, adjacent brothels, which were already well established prior to the arrival of Allied troops. Prostitutes were regularly examined, and military police assigned at each house were there to ensure that every man received a prophylaxis prior to leaving. In addition to these uh, measures, the, the military continued to promote, promote abstinence, excuse me, never completely giving up on that idea. Statistics, however, would shed light on potential failures of these carefully applied measures. The truth was that in spite of these measures, venereal disease rates could actually parallel rates of prophylaxis. In the 7th US Army, for example, at this time, with pro stations set up and carefully regulated throughout North Africa and the Mediterranean theater, venereal disease rates nearly quadrupled over a four month period. These somewhat embarrassing signs of prophylaxis failure continue to spur intensive research aimed at lowering rates of disease. One such improvement was the development of the private or individual prophylaxis packet that could be distributed and used anywhere. This one, developed by the pharmaceutical corporation John Wyeth and Brothers contains three steps or three individual elements. Soap, the previously mentioned silver nitrate, and then a mercury-based ointment. Uh, the same company would also distribute posters to promote the use and effectiveness of the products, which were endorsed by the military for a short time. Soap, silver, mercury, knockout VD. Uh, the silver nitrate Solution proved, however, to be ineffective against gonorrhea and also very irritating uh, once injected into the urethra. Uh, chemical urethritis was not uh, unusual. Three individual steps were also cumbersome. So advances were made by shifting to, shifting to a single tube of calomel sulfathiazole ointment uh, was a significant step in several regards. For one, the solution was effective against both syphilis and gonorrhea. But perhaps more importantly, uh, the solution was not painful to administer, thereby increasing the likelihood of use. So 
1944, a new standardized kit with the notation Pro Kit was developed and distributed, marking the most important advancement made in venereal disease uh, treatment up to this or uh, prophylaxis up to this point. As this poster suggests, the military was very interested in promoting the ease and use of the new standard Pro Kit. With prophylaxis now available in the form of a convenient and discreet take home packet and with penicillin just around the corner, the days of the pro station were limited. So, we're wrapping things up briefly. Uh, Alexander Fleming, uh, we're moving back just a little bit now, discovered penicillin. This is a, a, talk, a subject that deserves a talk on its own. Uh, discovered penicillin in 1928. There is a popular notion or belief that the discovery was an accident. This is not accurate. I will quote from the article published by Fleming in the British Journal of Experimental Pathology. Quote, penicillin in regard to infections with sensitive microbes appears to have some advantages over the well-known chemical antiseptics. Experiments in connection with its value in the treatment of pyogenic infections are in progress. In addition, to its possible use in the treatment of bacterial infections, penicillin is certainly useful to the bacteriologist for its power in inhibiting unwanted microbes in bacterial culture. That doesn't sound like an accident to me. Uh, Fleming deduced from an observation, a very careful observation made in his experimental laboratory that penicillin was potentially worth developing. Why almost 10 years elapsed between this publication and the multinational effort to produce a drug is beyond the scope of this talk. But by 1944, penicillin was becoming available for use by the military, and it was formally adopted as a standard uh, treatment for syphilis in 1944. So with the introduction of penicillin almost overnight, the military would begin to shift away from prostations as a unit of venereal disease control. Uh, instead of a highly toxic arsenic-based treatment lasting months to years, now VD could be treated within days with very few side effects from this new drug. There was no longer a need for the military to educate on the use of prophylaxis and to advertise their locations on and off base. There was no longer a need to portray sailors as dunces for not going to the pro station after sexual contact. And as pro stations quickly faded away, so did the propaganda associated with them. Government funded institutes that had been charged with designing, printing, and distributing pro station propaganda suddenly lost all their funding and the production of the material abruptly halted once and for all. So uh, with the advent of penicillin and the defeat of the Axis, the question shifted from will venereal prophylaxis work in soldiers in theater to will the eradicating efficacy of penicillin encourage licentiousness and debauchery in military and civilian populations alike? Religious, government, civil, and military leaders would continue to try and answer this question but as rates of venereal disease surged and ebbed in the years following the war, the answer was difficult to see. Today, syphilis continues to be a public health issue, especially with the emergence of antibiotic resistant strains. While the future of venereal disease medicine is uncertain, the past or at least one small aspect of it as represented by the military prostation can still easily be viewed um, through prophylaxis propaganda posters. Thank you all for coming. So we'll start with people in person and those listening online, feel free to put yours in the chat. Anyone have? I know that mercury is very toxic if you get it in your mouth. And that's why we have had the Mad Hatter because they were, I had something to do with putting mercury on hat brims. Was mercury toxic? Um, to any extent when when injected? Yes, it was. Uh, as what, you know, or, or the early attempts at chemotherapy, even now, chemotherapy is, uh, you know, as we're kind of shifting to an era of, uh, of, you know, chemotherapies using antibodies, we're moving away from the more highly toxic compounds, which was basically, uh, I, I hope there are no oncologists in the, in the room, but the way I view it is, you know, Chemotherapy is just a, 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 a drug, a toxic drug 
that you give somebody to try and kill the cancer, more cancer cells than their own cells. So uh, early chemotherapies, especially, you know, arsenic uh, based ones were, were very toxic. They became less toxic with new formulations. But mercury had uh, side effects as well. And this is more of a comment. ECU has a, an exhibit of a mercury syringe mm. over at the uh, marine uh, archaeology exhibit. Mm. Oh. They found a syringe, one of the large syringes there in the ship, the Blackbeard ship. And I was getting the tour, and the guy was talking about injecting people. And I, get, and I came back to him afterwards and said, that wasn't for injections in the arm. That was for injections somewhere else, mm. right? And they were using mercury even on Blackbeard ship. Mm. And uh, Lewis and Clark had the mercury syringes that they would syringe the urethra also. That's what I'll treat. Mm. And anyone who's interested in seeing a 3D model or well, copy of that syringe from Blackbeard ship, it's downstairs on the second floor of the library. It's an exhibit by the elevator. Do you know if a lot of emphasis was given on prophylaxis with condoms? Yes, the, uh, you know, I believe that as America was kind of leaving this uh, era of, uh, you know, social hygiene and uh, moral, uh, you know, sort of church leaders getting in front of these issues, trying to uh, promote abstinence, they were worried that condoms advocating for these condoms is basically synonymous with advocating for, you know, saying you could have sex. But uh, condoms were available and they made a distinction in the, um, in their, uh, you know, approach to this between mechanical prophylaxis and, and post-exposure chemical prophylaxis. So um, the assumption was that if a soldier has had uh, intercourse that they did not use a mechanical uh, uh, prophylaxis, even if that soldier did, and so, by military code, they had to go and undergo this prophylaxis, this post-exposure prophy uh, chemical prophylaxis treatment. But uh, there was mechanical prophylaxis was an important component to this. I wondered about the silver nitrate in the urethra. I don't know how the counter uh, response compares to mercury, but they also had a lot of urethral scriptures. They did. There were some uh, significant, you know, uh, side effects to that. Um, and uh, there was a reason when Dr. Moore said, you know, when he had strict military control over these populations, he could have 100,000 prophylaxis, you know, uh, um, prophylaxis treatments administered in a year. In one year, 100,000, but in, in private practice or, at, you know, at the John Hopkins, the, the Venereal Disease, uh, you know, Treatment Institute, he had only two in a 23-year period. So if people aren't forced by threat of court martial to do these, to put a uh, silver nitrate in your urethra, you're not going to do it. I notice in the poster that's on the screen right now, and also were the two where you had bugs of, of uh, syphilis and gonorrhea, mm -hmm. something that today we would recognize as racist. Now, I understand it was a very different time, uh, but I would like to, you know, say that today that poster is considered racist. Mm. And I'm not saying, you know, not saying don't do any, you know, I'm not asking for anything to be done with it. I'm just saying let's, let's recognize racism today when we see it. Thank you. Um. Did uh, were there any benefits uh, going to the pro station? Uh, did people improve uh, app or any statistics? Of, uh, was this helpful? So statistics were based on whether the soldier would develop venereal disease following the prophylaxis treatment. Um, but there weren't statistics of which soldiers actually had contact with venereal disease prior to coming into the clinic. So um, the rate really, the success of the prophylaxis, it was linked to the uh, incidence of venereal disease in, in the area that the soldiers were kind of, you know, frequenting. Um, 
So it, the, this, the prophylaxis treatment wasn't, you know, um, the way I think we view things now wouldn't necessarily, you know, inhibit or prevent every infection. <laughs> There's definitely the negative reinforcement of the, you know, the pain. I'm not sure. That's a great question. Uh, it sounds like even with that, those positive reinforcements, people would still kind of stay away. But um, oh, we have one more. Oh yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Was there any noticeable like uptick in people going to the pro station once the propaganda campaign started? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I just don't know. That that type of data is pretty, uh, you know, specific to an army or a sector. Um, the books I've seen, I haven't done extensive research, you know, don't have that really, um, you know, kind of tabulated uh, across the military. Um, but I, I'm, I'd be interested to, to look more into that. Hey, As a follow up to that, have you had any seen any statistics on the number of kits distributed during the pandemic? Um, it would be in the millions. It would be, um, it would be, uh, you know, a lot of them, but I don't. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. Well, you know, there was, uh, the, um, the company that made this poster, uh, John wife and brothers made that 1st pro that 1st, small, uh, kind of prophylactic package. And there was certainly financial incentive for them. You know, there were, there were other companies that were, you know, in, uh, in the business of doing that too. And so, you know, they were, they were trying to sell their material to the, uh, the military, which had, you know, spending a ton of money. Yeah, I, I, yeah no, good, good question. I don't know. Well, maybe just throw them in the ocean, you know, and, you know wash them, throw them overboard if you're on a trip. Speaking of that, maybe think of another question. Was there like an expiration date for the kits at all? Well, you know, you can buy these on eBay and I wouldn't encourage you to use them, um, but uh, I don't know if they were uh, marked with an expiration date, but you know, they're, the, the kits themselves are, you know, pretty, you know, they're available on eBay. So that I think suggests, uh, uh, you know, that there, there are just so many, there were so many of them um, made. So. I guess I was just wondering if they would, if they had supply left over from the a previous year or something, if they just kept them thinking they were still effective or if there was any data about it, them throwing away a lot of them over time. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. <laughs> Scratch out the previous uh, expiration date and yeah. put a new one next to it. What was the second agent you said that was used for the urethra? Um, it was uh, oh, um, that would be the one that was less irritating. Um, calomel sulfathiazole. So calomel is an, a mercury-based uh, compound with uh, sulfathiazole. Gotcha. We we still do uh, an antibiotic cream in newborns' eyes. To prevent uh, gonorrhea and can you say that one more time? We still use an antibiotic cream in newborns' eyes right after birth to prevent gonorrhea and chlamydia. What is that? I think it's erythromycin, but we've used a couple of different agents mm -hmm. that I know of. Mary Laura, you've been waiting patiently. I was just going to ask if you've seen any um, similar issues in other armies. Um, like, you know, the French, was there similar propaganda? Were there similar efforts? Did they have the same kind of problems or have you just kind of focused on the American army? Um, so the French, you know, so the French have venereal disease, uh, more kind of civilian aimed uh, posters that are from before the war. Um, you know, during, I, I know some of these American posters ended up in uh, France uh, in occupied territories. Uh, there are some interesting French uh, public health venereal disease posters, not so many uh, military. There are some 
German ones, but you know, Germany and 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 uh, the Soviet Union were so occupied at you know killing millions and millions of people that they didn't have the same amount of resources to uh, devote to this um, uh, effort. Uh, but you know, uh, um, in the East, Russian soldiers, you know, the, the, they or, or Soviet soldiers, I'm sorry, in order to sort of you know try and get out of duty, they would shoot themselves, which was all an, an offense that you know. That was punishable by death. Um, so the equivalent in the American army was, you know, try and actually get a venereal disease to get pulled from service, but that was also punishable by court martial, but not not by firing squad. Uh, the British have some. So the the allies, so the British have some to answer your question, um, and Americans, I don't I haven't seen as many you know, from uh, French, German, or Soviet. Any additional questions? No. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for coming. All right. And if you haven't signed in yet, uh, we've got a sign in sheet, and also we've got plenty of.